Good afternoon and welcome from a very chilly Johannesburg. Uh, winter has arrived with a vengeance and I'm not the happiest camper, but thank you so much for joining us for this winter series of bite-sized corrosion conversations. And we're really hoping that our conversation will be warming even if the air temperature isn't. And we know that through the last uh, few months of our bite-sized corrosion series, we've been looking at how we can wage war against corrosion. And today we're going to be having another look at this battle against corrosion as we look in some more detail at coating selection. How do we make the choice? Well, we're going to be in the capable hands of Neil Webb. So Neil, it's over to you. Thank you, Vanessa. So this discussion today is on coating selection for corrosion control. And a few weeks ago when Vanessa was presenting the series on coatings, she made the comment that coatings are the first line of defense against corrosion when we're looking at, in that particular case, the corrosion protection of pipelines. But coatings are the first line of defense in many ways. It's quite an appropriate analogy at the moment, seeing that last Sunday was the anniversary of D-Day on the 6th of June. Defenses take many forms. In the days of trench warfare, trenches and burns and so on were considered good defense. But a defense is only good if it cannot be penetrated. And here we see a coating where the coating itself has actually got a bunch of holes in it. And so corrosion can start and you can actually see rust staining starting at these points where the defenses have been breached. So we can build up the defenses. For example, the walled cities had battlements, but the corrosion enemy, if we want to call him that, has got some pretty mean stuff in his armory. And these battlements were not much good against cannonballs. And one of the cannonballs that we really have to deal with in the corrosion situation is that of the chloride ion. And the chloride ion is prevalent in particularly in marine environments, as you can see the state of this ship, which is being severely battered and is busy disappearing at a fairly rapid rate of knots, excuse the pun. So in looking at the selection of coatings, we need to consider a whole lot of different aspects. The location, where is it? What is the environment like? Is it arid or humid? What's the rainfall? How hot is it? What's the humidity? What's the chemical contamination like? And so on and so on. And one of the best weapons that we have in our armory in terms of coating selection is a very useful standard that has been put out by ISO. It's called ISO 12944. And there are nine sections of it, if I remember correctly. But this set of standards gives us guidance in terms of what coatings to use in under what conditions. But we need to know how corrosive is the environment. We need to know how long the coating has to last. You know, one is going to use a very different system if you only want something to last five years compared with 20 years. And then which coating system should be used? And there is a bewildering array of coatings that is available. We have here in South Africa a very excellent publication that was done by Darrell Janssen van Rensburg as part of her thesis for the university, where she has taken an original corrosion map developed by the CSIR and expanded it and updated it. And it defines the overall corrosion conditions that you will expect to find in various parts of the country. And similar map exists for many, many parts of the world. And this is a really good first stop to decide what sort of environment you have to deal with in terms of selecting a coating system. We need to remember though that even in arid conditions, we have challenges that are not necessarily immediately apparent. If you were to put some coatings in this desert environment, they would literally shrivel up and die just like the vegetation does because they are not resistant to the effects of ultraviolet light. 
But perhaps the biggest issue with corrosion is that of humidity. This gives a very good example of the effect of humidity. This illustration is the result of differing levels of humidity on the corrosion of pre-stressing wires in a cable stayed bridge. And you can see that as the humidity climbs above 60%, so the corrosion rate increases drastically. One thing we need to remember in terms of our coating selection is that all organic coatings are permeable to both water vapor and oxygen. And it's just a case of how long it takes for these two components to actually diffuse or osmose through the coating. And when those components, water vapor and oxygen, get to the substrate, they may well find that there is an, a situation that actually promotes corrosion. In this photograph, you can actually see that on the left-hand side here, we have residual mill scale, and the rest of the photograph is already pretty corroded. When we look back at the corrosion cell that we are very familiar with, we normally look at iron and copper or zinc and iron. But here, if we just have a look at this, as the anode, we have iron. As the cathode, we have mill scale or iron oxide. And when you have these two components on the surface, you have a built-in corrosion cell. So when oxygen and water vapor gets through to the substrate, having diffused through the coating, which is permeable, you then land up with this situation. And this particular example is a photograph taken on a structure in those desert conditions, which was subjected to overnight sea mist that came rolling in off the coast. You can see the way that the underlying mill scale that was left on the surface has resulted in the degradation of the surface. This happened within something like six months or so of application. So what have we got in our paint pot that is going to help us to prevent corrosion? Firstly, we have the actual resin from which the name of the coating is derived. And into that resin, we add pigments, which we'll look at the function of those, and pigments are solid materials generally. We have to make sure that the system is liquid in order to be applied. So there's probably some solvent in it, although there may not necessarily be. And there are all sorts of other additives. Now, in this particular slide, we can see that there are four components. If you choose to go and have a look at how people define what's in a paint, you'll find anything from three components to 30 components. It depends on how detailed you want to be. Let's firstly have a look at the binders or resins that make up the coating. And this goes back to the very first resins, which were possibly linseed oil based. The binder is the material that starts out as a liquid, you apply it to the surface, and it then converts into a solid. And this conversion process is what is known as curing. Depending on what all is in the binder or resin, you may well find that it dries before it cures. And drying really means it goes from a liquid to a solid, it does not necessarily mean that it has changed from the liquid state to the fully cured or reacted state where it now forms the film that is resistant to oxygen, water vapor, chemicals, and everything else. And sometimes we have quite a lot of problems with coatings which have dried but not cured. Whether the material is single pack or twin pack actually makes no difference in terms of curing. Single pack materials can react with oxygen or they can react with water vapor in order to cure. Twin pack materials, you mix the two components together and that reaction causes the curing. There is a family of coatings which don't actually cure by means of a chemical change, but actually only by the evaporation of solvents. And nail polish is probably one of the best examples of that coating. I think it would be quite expensive to paint a industrial structure with nail polish but there are industrial equivalents to that. 
The solvents that are in the coating are often known as taxis. Taxis are vehicles that carry people from one place to another. Solvents are the taxis that take the coating from the paint tin and put it on the surface, and then they evaporate and go away. We can add thinners to make the coating more easily applied. These thinners are generally the same family as the solvents that are already in the resin. And this is a very important aspect of coating application is to make sure that the correct thinners are used. Otherwise we can get some very unpleasant and unwanted results. So what binders do we have available that we can use? Well, here's a list of some of them. Alkyds, polyurethanes, inorganic zincs, acrylics, epoxies. Where do we use them? How do we use them? Well, that's the subject of many weeks of study. And there's absolutely no way that we can go through all of that in the 20 minutes or so that we have available today. So I'm just going to give you some basic introductions as to some of the things that we look at when selecting coatings. Other than the binder and continuing in our military theme, we've got a host of other components in our system which provide us with, with corrosion protection. Most important is that the coating that is being applied has to be applied to a clean surface. If it's not clean, then the coating adhesion is affected. And we also have the possibility of corrosion reactions that are, can occur. And often blistering or osmotic blistering is caused by the reaction between moisture and oxygen that diffuses through the coating and reacts with dirt that is left on the surface of the steel before it is coated. In talking about adhesion, one of the best ways of achieving adhesion is to have a rough surface, which in effectively increases the surface area that is available for the bonding reaction that occurs between the coating and the surface itself. I've grabbed zinc phosphate as an example. This is a, an active pigment. It's a material that is incorporated into the coating, which actually helps to prevent the corrosion reaction from occurring. And there has been and is a whole family of these reactive or inhibitive pigments that are available. When we have a coating system, as you can see in this photograph, which is a cross section between across um, in this uh, four layers of coating, you may well find that you have zinc phosphate or other pigments in these various layers, which help to prevent the corrosion reaction from occurring. Now, just as in times gone by, various military defenses have become ineffective, we have the same problem with our fight against corrosion. The problem is not that the defenses are ineffective. The problem is that the defenses are now illegal. It is the environmental aspect of these materials which has prevented their use. So red lead was one of the most popular pigments that was used to prevent corrosion and it's, it's extremely effective as is zinc chromate. However, most both of these have now been banned because of their toxicity and their tendency to cause cancer. They're known as carcinogens or toxins. So we don't have those in our armory anymore. One of the things that we have in our armory is metallic zinc. This can be used as a coating on its own, as in galvanizing. And galvanizing is an excellent corrosion protection system because the zinc forms passive layers in the presence of oxygen, which actually slow down the corrosion reactions and give us far greater life than ordinary uncoated steel. There's an acronym that can be used to describe the various mechanisms that we have in our armory against corrosion. And we call it the big picture. B stands for barrier type coatings. In other words, all we are doing is preventing the environment from getting through to the substrate. And in this regard, pigments such as glass flake, micaceous iron oxide, perhaps leafing aluminum and other things like that are very effective. This cross section shows you the effect of glass flakes. Now these are very large glass flakes compared to what is used in modern coatings. And you can see that these glass flakes 
will prevent the diffusion of water vapor and oxygen through the coating as they move down towards the surface. The next one that we have already mentioned is that of inhibitive pigments, such as zinc phosphate. And in your typical coating, you will have these inhibitive pigments in the layers that are close to the substrate. Now in this photograph, the substrate would have been where the red resin is at the bottom. This is a paint flake that was taken off a failed coating and mounted in resin to have a look at the composition of the coating. And the original substrate was there where the red resin is now in the bottom of the picture. And that gives you a really good example of what the original profile of the surface would have looked like. Our third general classification of types of coatings and pigments is galvanic. And in that case, we are talking about the active metallic zinc pigments, which if they're not in the form of galvanizing, can be applied in the form of zinc dust in various binders. The biggest challenge with this is to make sure that you've got enough zinc in that coating that those zinc particles actually touch each other and provide you with electrical continuity. Otherwise, the galvanic action cannot be effective. So when we come to select the coatings that we're going to use, we have to consider a number of things. So please consider the environment, not only the macro environment as per that corrosion map, but also the micro environment. And I'm going to show you an example of, of a micro environment in a moment. If you take a chemical process and put it in the desert, the corrosion that occurs in and around that chemical process is going to be specific to that process and will have nothing to do with the fact that it is in the desert. Another aspect is that of the interim condition, that which happens during construction. So if you have a fairly low level coating system that is designed for indoor use, where it's a dry air conditioned atmosphere, like an office block or a warehouse, but during construction, this is exposed to high humidity and marine environments, for example, that system that was designed for indoors is going to fail very quickly. We need to consider what we are applying the material to. Are we applying it to heavy steel, light gauge steel, galvanized steel, stainless steel, clean steel, dirty steel? All these different aspects need to be considered when selecting the coating that's going to go on the top. What surface preparation are we going to use? You cannot blast clean thin gauge plate because the surface energy from the blasting will cause that plate to buckle significantly. And then we need to make sure that we have addressed the aspect of life cycle costing. We do not want to apply a coating that needs repair or recoating every three years if your, if your structure is required to have a 50-year life. You really only want to maybe coat it every 10 years or every 20 years, depending on the access. Using a low-cost coating at the construction phase is going to land up with high repeat costs as we progress through the, the life cycle of the component. So here's an example of um, considering the substrate. In this case, the substrate was galvanized steel, thin gauge. It had not been prepared correctly. And the net result was the coating that was applied just peeled off in sheets. Another aspect of galvanizing is that of the nature of the zinc surface. This is taken from times gone by when they used to make soap by mixing fat and lye. Lye being sodium hydroxide effectively or sodium carbonate. In other words, an alkaline. The net result of, of mixing an alkaline material with oil is that you create soap. Now, have you ever tried to stick something onto soap? We use soap to get stuff off. So soap is a very, very effective bonding release agent. And what happens with galvanizing is that the galvanized, the zinc corrosion products are in fact alkaline. And if you go and put an oil-based coating, such as an alkyd coating, onto zinc, when the corrosion process starts, the zinc corrosion products are alkaline. And the net result is that this alkaline reaction 
with the oil-based, because alkyd is a type of oil-based resin, creates a layer of soap between the coating and the substrate, and it all comes off. This looks like a very innocuous environment, and yet it is a situation where exactly what we spoke about before, about micro-environments, came to have some deleterious effects. The boathouses had galvanized structures and galvanized doors, and these had been coated with an alkyd resin. And the high humidity associated with the proximity to the water, plus the low temperatures associated with the river, landed up with this coating then reacting with the substrate and requiring recoating every two years or so, much to the distress of the owners of the infrastructure. So here are a few things that you do not want to do when you're selecting a coating. Don't paint over mill scale. Don't use oil-based paints on galvanizing. Don't expose epoxy to ultraviolet light. It doesn't like it. It, de it degrades. Don't use the wrong thinners. We spoke about solvents and thinners, and we have a very common component in South Africa called lacquer thinners, which loosely translated in Afrikaans is lacquer thinners, because that's quick and easy, but unfortunately, often leads to problems. Walk by specifications, what are those? Well, you walk past the filing cabinet, open the drawer, pull out the last system you used and reapply it. It's a recipe for disaster. We have a plethora of components that we have available to us. You can just see all those different names and you have a very confused bird sitting in the tree. His name's Polly and he represents all the polys, polyurethane, polyurea, polyaspartic, polysiloxane, polyester. How about polyfiller? I don't think so. Make use of the materials that give you added protection in the form of, say, glass flake, micaceous cyanoxide. oxide. And the net result is that you'll land up with a coating system that does its job, which is what we want to achieve, because after all, Swiss cheese does not work very well as a coating system. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. It might not work well as a coating system, but Swiss cheese is appealing for lunch. Yeah, especially in the form of a fondue. Now we're talking on a cold day like this, that sounds fabulous. Coating selection is really such an enormous topic and something that maybe we can explore in more depth over time. There are a couple of questions that have come up. So Neil, what is the difference between something like, say, nail polish that can be redissolved with a remover and other single pack coatings that cannot be dissolved again once they've been cured? Well, the difference is in the resin that is used for the coating material. A good example of that is what's known as a vinyl coating, for example. Vinyl is a resin that can be dissolved in a solvent and you can apply it to the substrate and it then the solvent will dissolve and leave a film of vinyl behind. And you can come back years later and dissolve that vinyl off again using the same solvent. And there are a couple of resins that fall into that category. Whereas other single pack coatings, for example, high gloss enamel is a good example of what is known as an alkyd coating. That resin is also dissolved in solvent when you apply it, the solvent evaporates and, and leaves the resin behind. But that resin then reacts with the oxygen in the atmosphere and forms a relatively hard cured coating, which will not redissolve in the thinners or the solvents because it has in fact undergone a chemical change. And so that would have ramifications on the overcoating process. Um, what you can and can't Correct. apply over the various coatings. Correct, yes. yes. Right. So for example, vinyl coatings are very common in the marine industry because they are easily maintained. So when you come and overcoat it with vinyl, the solvent bites into the existing system and, and creates a continuous film. If you come along and overcoat it with something like an epoxy with a very high powered solvent, it's actually going to destroy the vinyl and you're going to land up with a wonderful coating failure. Which wouldn't be ideal in a marine environment. 
just your your picture of the of the bird in the tree when there are so many coatings available any clues on which poly i choose <laughs> I would say that the starting point would be to evaluate your environment and your conditions, then go to the ISO standard, find the corresponding ISO classification for your particular situation. And then you may land up with, say, um, a C3 environment, which is light industrial environment with relatively low humidity. And you then go along to the industrial coating manufacturers and say, okay, I'm looking for a medium durability, having because there are various durabilities available in the ISO standard. And you say, right, I've got a C3 environment. I want a medium durability. What have you got? And take it from there. And that way you're asking the people who deal with it all the time to give you their best options and then right. can start asking intelligent questions based on their responses. Yeah. Super. Thank you, Neil. Hopefully this has piqued your interest and the little bit of new knowledge that you may have gained will have made your lunchtime experience with us fairly palatable. Thank you so much.